Hi everyone, so we've looked at uh, the job that Parliament's done, we've evaluated what sort of a job we think it is that Parliament's doing. Now we're going to look at how that job has changed in recent times. And while we're doing this, I want you to think back to those three flaws that we identified, specifically the compliant majority and the institutional imbalance and, of course, the bypass, the parliamentary bypass. And ask yourself, to what extent uh, do these reforms try to tackle those three problems or do they perhaps just try to tackle a different problem? Uh, anyway, keep that in mind because there have been reforms and we need to talk about them. And we're going to start off by looking at uh, the reforms of the House of Commons and we find that there are two types really. We've got the reforms subsequent to the Wright Report and other reforms. Now, the Wright Report uh, was a super piece of work that the Labour government chucked out or the, the Labour government asked of Parliament 2008, 2009, and I don't know if you can see, but uh, Dr. Tony Wright uh, was the chairman, and of course he came from the Labour Party, hence the Wright Report. Now, if we go down here, we can find that he identified three particular areas that he wanted to look at, uh, select committees, uh, business in the House, and finally, uh, public involvement. Now, there were many, many other things that he went on to discuss, but those were the main ones. I want you to remember that, because we'll talk about those in a minute. In terms of other reports, we've other reforms. Sorry, we've got the Fixed Term Parliament Act uh, and the reining in of the Royal Prerogative, both in terms of treaties and military deployment, and a reduction in size. Um, does size matter? Uh, I'm not so sure, really. I mean, it's all over the place, but you know, it hasn't really varied slightly. The biggest single change, really, has been the reduction in size from 78 to 58, and of course, you'll notice the date there, so that is tied into devolution. And uh, that had a much greater impact on the Labour Party. Uh, but of course, that impact of 72 to 59 doesn't matter if you lose all of the seats, uh, which, of course, pretty much happened uh, last uh, uh, in the last election. So um, big change there in terms of representation for Scotland. Uh, funnily enough, that not being reflected in Northern Ireland or indeed uh, in, uh, in Cardiff. Uh, there you go. So does size matter? I'm, I'm not sure that's entirely pertinent, but there are many, many more important things to talk about, particularly the right committee. And we'll split this into implemented and not implemented. And um, these are the real areas they looked at. Now, you'll remember that the areas that he said he wanted to look at was business of the house and uh, select committees and, of course, public engagement. And you can see perhaps how these three things relate back to that. The Backbench Business Committee was created. It was given a very, very limited role, much more limited than uh, the Right Committee uh, uh, envisaged. They wanted uh, the uh, Backbench Business Committee to determine uh, the House agenda. Uh, select committees, well, chairs are directly elected by secret ballot, and members are now elected from party groups uh, by secret ballot. So this much diminishes uh, the role of whips. So the whips are being excluded. Uh, and uh, that's good news. That's really good news. And it has made uh, select committees much more assertive uh, going forward. E-petitions, well, we kind of covered those when we looked at debates. Sometimes they're good, sometimes they're not. Certainly a public airing for the, all of these things is never a bad idea, but that doesn't necessarily mean that anything's going to change. And really, that's what we're looking at here. Uh, the Right Committee report did recommend that there should be far fewer select committees and that there should have fewer numbers. That didn't happen. It also said that House business should be scheduled by the House rather than by government, and that didn't happen. Um, and so pretty much, you know, was that a win? Was it a lose? It was certainly better than it was, but it was nowhere near as good as it could have been. Other reforms, the Fixed Term Parliament Act. I don't think this is particularly important because either you fix... Well, basically, you have an electoral schedule and you've got policies. Now, either you fix the election to meet the policies or you fix the policies to meet the election schedule. So either way, uh, it's a zero sum game as far as the uh, as far as the people are concerned. But it does mean that the, car the government cannot call a snap election at a time that is propitious or at a time that suits uh, the government in particular. Reining in the Royal Prerogative, now this is much, much, much more important because what we're seeing here are policy decisions. These are policy, not legal decisions. And so to a certain extent, what we've seen here is a shunt in policy sovereignty from government to parliament. And while everything else is very important, while, I, while, while the right committee is very, very important, in terms of actually looking at a rebalancing 
of the relationship between the Commons, the, sorry, government and Parliament. The reining in of the royal prerogative, specifically these votes on military deployment and on treaties, is probably the single most significant change in the relationship between government and Parliament. There are some significant changes within the makeup of Parliament, but in terms of changes in the relationship between government and Parliament, this reining in of the royal prerogative is very, very, very important. And uh, I would certainly make sure that you know that the uh, Constitutional Reform and Governance Act of, of 2010 means that any treaty with our European neighbours or indeed with anybody else will need to be voted on uh, by Parliament. And uh, again, any vote on military deployment will be, sorry, any decision or any, any military deployment will be subject to uh, the approval of Parliament. And that is a shunt in the nature of policy or in the location of policy sovereignty. Parliament is getting more powerful, and that is very, very important. Um, and that's about it for reform. These are the things that were raised but were not challenged. Uh, the West Lothian question is there. Parliamentary control of parliamentary business is there. We kind of addressed that one already. Recall, this is the ability of citizens to trigger a by-election should an MP perform too egregious a, um, a, a, an act that simply can't be tolerated. Uh, this obviously came up in the white in the wake of the uh, in the wake of the um, in the wake of the expenses scandal, and uh, it's still out there. We haven't really got this effective recall mechanism and uh, electoral reform. Well, the AV still the AV was a, an appalling choice. The Lib Dems got hoodwinked into it, and um, we were offered a um, uh, we were offered an unpalatable alternative. Now remember, we were looking at those three flaws. We were looking at the three flaws, the compliant majority, the institutional imbalance, and the parliamentary bypass. And if we look at this, the West Lothian question, well, that has direct implications with the, constitution, with the uh, compliant majority. Uh, this is obviously the institutional imbalance. Uh, recall, this would affect the compliant majority, and so would electoral reform. So perhaps you can see here reasons why government didn't espouse or didn't embrace any of these particular issues with perhaps the same degree of enthusiasm with which it was able to pursue some of the less significant aspects of the right committee report. Well, maybe that's just me being cynical. Anyway, let's move on to the House of Lords. Now, with the House of Lords, we had a huge start. In 1999, all but 92 hereditary peers were kicked out. That left 92 seats for hereditary peers, and they were elected from their peer group. Boom, boom, thank you. Um, what happened here was, if you... Uh, were a member of the House of Lords because a 200, 300 years ago your great, 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 great grandmother baked a cake for Queen Anne. Well, I'm afraid that no longer gave you the right to sit in our legislature. If you wanted to uh, remain within the legislature, then you would have to be elected from the pool of all of those people whose great, 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 great grandparents bought, baked cakes for peers or fought in battles for peers or covered a, a, a sorry, covered, fought battles for monarchs or covered uh, puddles with their cloaks for monarchs to walk across. So in other words, we're moving closer towards the 21st century, but we're not there quite yet. We've still got 92 of them there. Perhaps more significant was the, con well, actually not more significant, but yeah, I really like the Constitutional Reform Act of 2005. This relieved the House of Commons of its, the House of Lords, sorry, of its legal function, whereas previously the House of Lords had been the Court of Final Appeal. Now that was the Supreme Court. And uh, it also changed the Speaker. Uh, previously, the Speaker of the House of Lords had been the Lord Chancellor. Now, the Lord Chancellor was a, a senior cabinet position with an awful lot of power. And um, that was not good. Uh, the Lord Chancellor is now a much diminished role. And what we found is that the Constitutional Reform Act has taken a lot of his functions and redistributed them across the wider political thing. Uh, so great has been the, has so great, so, so vastly has this role been diminished that it's now uh, basically given to Michael Gove. Uh, it seems to go hand in hand with uh, the Secretary of State for Justice, the Justice Minister. Uh, but uh, and undoubtedly, this is a good thing. It was it was not particularly healthy that the Speaker of the House of Com House of Lords was a senior cabinet member while also being in charge of the judiciary. It was it was kind of awkward. Uh, anyway, that has finally been dealt with, and we're very, very happy about that. So, you know, three little bits there that uh, affect House of Lords reform. Um, specific issues are raised but not addressed. Well, we still don't have a wholly elected chamber, and because of that, the uh, the, the government can discount any uh, any objections raised to policy by the House of Lords. So, uh, the House of Lords uh, raises an objection to government either through select committees 
or indeed uh, through um, or indeed through uh, the legislative process and the House of Law. House of, sorry, the government can simply say, well, who voted for you? Uh, for whom are you speaking? Uh, so we don't have a wholly elected second chamber. The House of Lords Reform Act was supposed to be a staging post. By now, we were supposed to have a fully elected chamber, but of course, that would undermine government's ability to knock government uh, government's ability to knock the House of Lords about. So they didn't do it. It makes sense. No Turkey is going to vote for Christmas. The government is not going to create an institution that might make its job more difficult. Uh, and this comes back to the propriety of the appointment process. There was a massive scandal uh, in about 2006 whereby it turned out that uh, law, uh, lo loads and loads of peers were being created because people had loaned money to uh, the Labour Party. Um, this has been tidied up, but it's still wholly unsatisfactory. No one's entirely sure of the propriety of the appointment process. It's still very occluded, and there still seem to be a lot of people who find their way into the House of Lords by virtue of giving substantial donations to one party or another. Now, Huge amount of resources on this. I'm just going to focus on this particular one. This is a great page from a really, really great website. Democratic audit is really worth spending some time for time on. And it looks at the right reforms and uh, select committees and backbench business committees and the notion of recall and more reforms and forming the House of Lords. And uh, then finally, the North, the, the West Lothian question. Uh, this is a really, really super article, and uh, it will reward uh, time spent on it. Um, as I've got there, there are some more resources there, lots of resources in terms of the role prerogative, West Lothian question, blah, 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 blah. Um, what I'd like you to do, yes, is have a look at those, but then think, okay, well, where are we with the compliant majority? Where are we with the institutional imbalance? Where are we with parliamentary bypass? What, if anything, did these reforms do to tackle any of these problems that means that Parliament can't do its job properly? And what can we learn from that? Bring those questions along to class. I really look forward to answering them, and I'll speak to you then. Cheers now.